There's a wonderful place we call home. Tis a city of glory divine. It is built in the garden of rest. And a beautiful home shall be mine. Oh, that wonderful Eden so blessed. Where Jesus the Master has gone. To prepare us this glorious home. There he bids us a welcome to come. Oh, wonderful city of God, just across in that beautiful climb, where the angels' sweet echo of song in musical cadences chime. Oh, wonderful city of God, by faith in the distance I see There's a mansion prepared over there Yes, a place in that city for me When the jewels of Jesus are brought There to shine in that land of sweet song What a beautiful, beautiful thought that I shall be there in that throng. Sweetest peace to my soul it will be to behold such a glorious sign where the sun and the moon neither shine, but the glory of God is the light. Oh, wonderful city of God, just across in that beautiful climb where the angels' sweet echo of song in musical cadences chime. Oh, wonderful city of God, by faith in the distance I see. There's a mansion prepared over there. Yes, a place in that city for me. Going to pick up tonight where we left off this morning. We have looked at um, this song, some of the words to it, and tried to understand what the cross means in the terms of the love of Jesus and how that his life was indeed perfect. And then that was observed from a number of different individuals. And then, of course, we spent the majority of our time looking at um, <clears throat> the other... Sorry, I'm trying to get my keynote to where it needs to be. Um, and I think it's on the right spot, so I think we're good. So we spent some time talking about his painful death and then in the place of another. But now we want to come to the letter O when we look at the word love and use it. And that has to do with an observing father. And what we can never forget in the midst of the crucifixion is that it's not only Jesus who suffers on the cross, but it's also the Father who suffers with him. That there was pain in the heart of God at this moment as well. Actually, there are two emotions, uh, we might say, in the heart of God. And uh, there are a couple of occasions in the Old Testament where we kind of, the curtain is pulled back a little bit and we see into the heart of God and we see some mixture of emotions, so to speak. Uh, we talked about one on one occasion, not too in-depth, but Exodus 34, how God is gracious and merciful, but is what will by no means clear the guilty, and how those two ideas are a little bit um, different, and you have to have Jesus to understand how those two ideas come together. But there's also a text in Hosea chapter 11, and Hosea was a prophet to the ten northern tribes of Israel, and... <clears throat> He uses Hosea's life. He marries a daughter of the whoredoms, which is, that's God's word, because their spiritual idolatry throughout the Old Testament is pictured as whoredom. It's pictured as adultery. And <clears throat> so he's using Hosea's life. He, he marries Gomer, and they have a child together, and then Gomer goes and cheats on him with multiple men. And Hosea tries to pursue her, she will have none of it. And then when her lovers are done with her, she's put up at the auction block to be sold, and he goes and buys her back. 
and their marriage is reconciled. And that's a picture of what God is trying to do with Israel. He has married Israel, and they've gone out into spiritual idolatry. And unfortunately, they're going to have to go in and face the, the consequences of their crimes and, their puni- and face their punishment. But in that letter, or in that book, in chapter 11, when God pulls back his heart, the curtain to his heart and he says... How am I going to do this to you, Israel? How am I going to treat you like Adma and set you like Zeboam? Adma and Zeboam were the two other cities destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, because my heart is moved, is mixed, is churning within me with compassion. And so he understands because of their sin, they have to be punished. But his love for them, it hurts him to have to do that. And so there's that tension of emotions and so when we look at the cross, there's actually a tension, a tension of emotions, not only with us, but in the heart of God himself. And the first thing we see as we look at the heart of God as he observes is that of his sorrow. I believe Genesis 22 gives us the closest picture. We're not really given a lot of insight into what was going on into the heart of God. Uh, God the Father, that is, in the midst of this crucifixion, we are given some insight, obviously, into the pain of Jesus, but not so much into the heart of the Father. But we do know that it pained him. Okay? And when you look at Genesis 22, because you have a father in Abraham offering his son Isaac, that can give you some kind of a glimpse, maybe, into the heart of God as his son was sacrificed. Because, as we said this morning, when we look at these things, we're not looking at... um, We're not looking at human beings. We, we kind of look at them as if they were superhuman. That is, they, they had no emotions. They just walked right through it and you know, never really had an emotion or a tinge or a, or a withdrawing or a, an urge on the inside that said, don't do this, I don't want to do this. But that's just not the picture that's painted by Scripture. And so when we look at Abraham offering Isaac, it's not like Abraham woke up the next morning and said, you know, it's another day at the office. I'm going to go slaughter my son. You know he had to struggle internally that entire three-day journey and then finally going up to the mountain and then when his son turns to him and asks, where is the lamb? He says God will provide himself one. But then as he goes through the painful process of binding his son and then gets the knife ready to kill him, to bleed him out, to cut his throat, to bleed him out as a sacrifice, you know his heart had to be turned now, we, I understand what Hebrews 11 says. He knew that God would raise him from the dead even if he killed him. But do you think he would have ever forgotten the experience of having to take the life of his son? You can just, there, it, as a parent, you can see how difficult that would be. And so when we're looking at the experience of God the Father with the Son as he is being tortured on the cross... As he is going through, literally, the word excruciating, okay? That's not a word, in my opinion, we need to throw around lightly. Because it comes from a Latin term that literally means out of the cross. It's a special type, a special level of suffering. And so, in my opinion, that's a word that doesn't need to be used very flippantly. Because it carries with it connotations that are connected to our Lord's suffering, which... I don't think we're ever going to fully understand. And so I'm, I try to be very cautious with that term. But you can see that type of pain and the excruciation, not just that Jesus experienced on the cross, but also that was going on in the heart of God the Father as well. Can you imagine sitting back as a human parent, sitting back and looking and watching someone torture my son in front of me? And to watch the things that are said to him? And done to him, knowing that he deserves none of them. And that he's doing it out of an act of supreme love. You see, at the end of Genesis 22, when, the, when Abraham has the knife pulled, ready to kill Isaac, the angel of the Lord calls out to him, and he says, Abraham, don't do anything, don't lay your hand upon him, because what? Now I know that you fear me. That you love me because you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And here's the point when you take that, because this Genesis 22 is a small picture of the cross. It's seen that way. Jesus may make mention, may be alluding to it in John 8, 
when he makes reference to Abraham saw his day and was re- and rejoiced to see that. Uh, Paul probably ha- definitely has reference to it in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8 about preaching the gospel beforehand to Abraham. But when you see its ultimate expression, what we can see, if, if God can look at Abraham offering his son, okay, going through all of that, and he can say, now I know you fear me. What can we then say about God the Father who didn't somewhat get too close to offering his son, but actually did offer his son? You see, then that enables you to be able to look at God and say, now I know that you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son, from me. You sacrificed him for me. And you went through all the, that sorrow and all of those emotions for me. And so while we're focused rightly on the cross and the things that are going on around it, we ought to also lift our gaze just a little bit higher into the heavens and see that God the Father is also hurting in the midst of this crucifixion. So that's one side of these emotions that's in tension, okay? The second side, we have to go to Isaiah chapter 53 in order to see. We can see it probably on a couple of different passages, but we're going to use Isaiah 53 And that is the idea of satisfaction. The idea of satisfaction. Look at Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 10. In the previous verses of Isaiah 53, he's been talking to us through the eyes of human beings. Okay, so he's despised, verse 3, and rejected of men, and man of sorrows acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he's despised, and we esteemed him not. Talking through the, the lens of humanity, when we looked at Jesus... We didn't see any value in him. We thought he was being punished for his sins is what he's saying. But in verse 10, the viewpoint shifts to God's viewpoint. And so he says in verse 10, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when, he makes his, when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. And so what you have also, not just the sorrow that fills the heart of God, but this other side, this other emotion that pulls in tension, is the, is the satisfaction of God. And this has to do with when you look at God's law, about sin. And so <clears throat> when sin is committed against a, an affront to the holiness and the character of God, when a sin is committed against God, that sin has to be punished. There is no way that God can look at a sin and say, eh, no big deal. That would be inconsistent with his nature. Every sin ever, that has ever been committed or ever will be committed will be punished. Okay? Now the question is how? Well, if we reject Jesus, then we will be punished directly for our sins. But in Jesus, he bore the penalty for us. And thus he satisfied God's justice. God poured down all of the wrath directed at sin upon Jesus that he might bear the punishment for it. And so when a person, this is Romans 3, when a person receives what Jesus has done through a penitent faith that obeys the gospel, that's immersed into water, that reenacts the death, burial, and resurrection, when a person does that, it's accepting the penalty that Jesus paid for us. And so when God the Father looks at the cross, there's deep pain in his heart over the sorrow, but there's also satisfaction because now his, his, his holy and righteous wrath is justified, and therefore he can open up the way for sinners to be forgiven. And so you have the tension of sorrow, but yet satisfaction. Because the satisfaction of his justice then allows him to forgive people of their sins. Because those sins have been punished in his son. That's why we call it substitutionary atonement. Or vicarious in the place of another vicarious suffering. That's what we see going on in the heavens. 
that mixture of emotions that you see in Exodus 34, that you see in Hosea chapter 11. You see all those things coming together once again, but yet finding a sense of satisfaction in the heart of God at the crucifixion. So we have an observing father. Number three, I don't think it's possible to look at the cross and not see the value of our souls. I just don't think that's possible. <clears throat> in Matthew 16 and verse 26, it's quoted in Mark chapter 8 as well and in Luke and other places. Jesus asks some rhetorical questions. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? Or what is a man willing to give in exchange for his soul? Those questions are rhetorical. Even if you gained the entire world, if the entire world came under your dominion and every person served you and everything belonged to you, and if you gained all of that, but yet you lost your soul, you wasted your time. The point he's making is there is nothing that can compare with the value of your soul. Now, when you take that, and C.S. Lewis is the one that I'm more familiar with that said it, I, although I don't think the thought is original with him, I think uh, from some of the things I've, I've heard, and I don't remember the exact individual, I think Lewis actually drew on somebody else to make this point. But I'll cite Lewis because he's the one I know said it. Okay. <clears throat> but C.S. Lewis used to make this point. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You see, when we think of it, we think of ourselves, we think of who we see in the mirror. We think that's who we are, and then who we are has a soul. But it's just the opposite. We are a soul, and we have a body. Our soul is who we actually are. It's the being that animates this body. Without my soul, this body is nothing. It's just a house. It's referred to as a house or a tent throughout Scripture. It's just a temporary dwelling place. This is just my house. Who I really am is my soul. And so what he's saying is, what does it profit if you gain all the world, but yet you lose yourself in the process? And so when we're looking at the value of the soul, we have to first see the estimate that Jesus places upon it, which is that there's nothing that's comparable to it. And that how easy it is to, to forget in all of our pursuits and all of our understanding that if we lose our soul, we've lost everything. We've lost everything. We can spend our whole time in whatever avenue of pursuit you want to make it. And some of those avenues of pursuit are not inherently bad. We can spend our time in business pursuits and there is nothing bad about business. We can spend our time in family pursuits and there's certainly nothing bad about family. We can spend our time in academic pursuits and there's nothing bad about academics. None of those things are inherently bad. But when they are elevated to the domination of who we are, they are sinful. Because those things are not of the same value as the soul. And so, that's key in making decisions and in understanding everything else. And we have to take a cue from Jesus. And if you don't think the soul is valuable, look at what it costs to redeem it. Look what it costs to redeem it. That's what he's saying in 1 Peter chapter 1 to persecuted Christians. He's talking to them about living a holy life. He said, your life has to be holy. It has to be separate from the world. Why? Because you weren't redeemed. Your, your soul cannot be redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from the vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But it had to come from the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. No one can hand over money and say, there, I'll redeem the soul. You can lose every bit of your money and you can gain it back in the same lifetime. You can lose your family and get it back in the same lifetime. You can lose every bit of academic achievement 
and get it back all in the same lifetime. But if you lose your soul, there is no getting it back. We get one chance with our soul. That's it. But isn't it so easy to forget that? Isn't it easy to get caught up in things that really, at the end of the day, don't matter? I mean, I have to, to, to succeed in school and succeed in business. Why? Because other people are going to look at me different. But, but at the end of the day, what difference does that make? What does it matter if I was the smartest person that walked the planet and I went to hell? Because I can promise you this, on judgment day, God is not going to come to me and he's not going to ask me, hey, how well could you hit a baseball? He's not going to come to me and say, now Brad, I've got a Greek New Testament here and I need you. And this would be a dirty trick that Dr. Gallagher would get him to play. I need you to take this Greek New Testament and I need you to translate it, parsing every word in the translation. And I did that. Or I could read the Greek New Testament, which I can't. Or if I had a string of letters behind my name, which I don't. It wouldn't matter if I lost my soul. God's not going to ask me to parse Greek sentences. He's going to ask me, did you do what the Bible said? God's not going to ask a businessman, hey, how, how, did, how did you draw up your business model? He's not going to hand our kids a biology test and say, here, if you pass this, you can get in. But why is it that we place so much emphasis on those things and we're willing to let the things that truly matter, the things by which we and those we love and we're entrusted to, we let those things take precedent over the most important thing? There was one thing impressed upon my mind from the second that I remember I have my first memories. My parents drilled into our brains. They did not care what we did for a living. They did not care if we were the lowest man on the totem pole as long as we loved God and we went to heaven. That was it. Because the value of the soul, there is nothing that can compare to it. And the very fact that Jesus had to endure the torture that we talked about this morning in all of those different ways, shouldn't that tell us something that how he sees our souls? There must be something inherently valuable about them for someone to do that. And so <clears throat> the implications that could spin off of that are numerous. The person who thinks they're worth nothing, the person who contemplates hurting themselves, the person who contemplates suicide, the person who doesn't feel loved or they feel unlovable. Again, the message of Genesis 22 rings forward. There's no way to be able to look at God and say, you don't love me because he gave me his son. And that's his point in Romans 8. He who didn't spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all. I learned that I'm valuable. But then the final thing, letter E, <clears throat> that we see at the cross is eternal life. Back in Matthew chapter 27, again, at, toward the end of the chapter in verse 51, when Jesus dies, there is a, an event that takes place. <clears throat> it says, And behold, a curtain in the, of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Now, don't ask me about 52 and 53, because to be honest with you, I have no idea what it means. Okay? That's why I stopped at 51. 
So this curtain, this veil in the temple. Now this veil in the temple um, <clears throat> separated the holy place from the most holy place. And it was several feet in the air. It, and it had a, a front layer. And so there was a beam running across the top and had a front layer and had a, a back layer on the back side of the beam. And so it was incredibly heavy. It took between one and 300 priests to hang it. And uh, <clears throat> so it's an incredibly heavy thing that, that's there. But of course, you remember the, the holy place is where the, you had the instruments. You had the uh, table of showbread, the altar of incense, things like that. And on the inside of the most holy place where the veil was separating was you had the Ark of the Covenant because that's where God's presence was. Now let's back away for a minute. <clears throat> when you look at this text, and why does the text say that the veil was torn from top to bottom? Why, why, does, he, why does he include that detail? Well, if you and I were to tear something like this, how would we do it? We'd start at the bottom, right, where we can reach, and then we would tear it up. It would be a tear from the bottom up. But the fact that it's a tear from the top to the bottom, that's not a human action. It's a divine one. Okay? So what was God saying now that Jesus, when he gave up the ghost on the cross, and then the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, an act of God? What was he saying? Well, you remember in our history of the dwelling places of God. In Eden, you had God and man in fellowship together. And then God, of course, withdraws because of man's sin. And then you have the building of the tabernacle slash temple. You know, two different eras. One's a permanent, one's a, a mobile structure. And so you've got that veil. And, of course, the holy place was a place where... And, and in the tabernacle, by the way, is the recreation of Eden. I think we've been through that. And... Um, <clears throat> So you had the, the holy place where the priests could go, but then the most holy place where God's presence was, that only the high priest could go once a year with an offering for himself and then for the sins of his people. And even then, it had to be a, a thing covered in smoke. He had to have the incense burning so that the, the smoke would, would kind of fill the room so as not to get direct contact. And so one person... So you go from Genesis 3 with God walking with man, and then you come here into the tabernacle and the temple, and God is back amongst men... But it's restricted. You've got a court where Israelites can go in the tabernacle. And then you've got a holy place where priests can go and a most holy place where all the high priests can go. You get to the permanent structure of the temple. You get a court of Gentiles, a court of women, a court of Jewish men, a holy place and a most holy place. God's presence is with his people, but it's restricted. So what does it then mean that the veil was torn in two. It meant that the way to heaven was now open. There was a sacrifice now that allowed people into the presence of God. And this is exactly what the writer of Hebrews is playing on in Hebrews 10, 19 and 20, when he says that Jesus consecrated for us a new and living way through the veil that is to say of his flesh he opened the curtains to heaven no longer would there be this restricted access and that's why as new testament christians we preach and teach a priesthood of all believers that is we don't have to go through other human beings to get to god we can go to god directly as priests ourselves we don't have to have other people pray for us. We can pray for ourselves. Because we have a high priest who has entered into the veil, is what Hebrews will go on to say. Not just torn it away, but has entered into it. And made an offering for our sins the way the high priest would. But then, of course, there are countless other texts of Scripture that could paint that picture that eternal life is open through the cross. The wages, the payment, the penalty of sin in chapter Romans 6.23 is death. That's what it deserves. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Harkening back to chapter 3, this is a continual flow in argument the way Romans works. And so chapter 3, it's harkening back to the propitiation, the appeasement made by Jesus on the cross of God's wrath. And so when we look at the cross, we're... 
able to see very clearly and very easily the love that God has. So when you look at the cross, the first thing that you see is a life that is given, but it wasn't just an ordinary life. It was a perfect life. The only one that's ever been. It was perfect in every way. It was taken very painfully because he's absorbing the blow of God against sin. But that was done in the place of another, ours. Then as we lift our gaze a little bit higher, we can see God, the sorrow that fills his heart, but at the same time the satisfaction of his justice and the opening up of forgiveness to all mankind. When you look yet again, you have to also learn as you contemplate it that we are, there's something valuable about us. You don't take that and run with it to an extreme where you oversell your value, but that you understand that you are valuable. And that eternal life is possible. It's attainable. So when we see the cross, we feel that same tension of emotions. There is that sense of sorrow and hatred because when we look at the cross, we understand we're responsible for this. These are, these are my sins that put him there. This, this is my fault. And I don't like that. But at the same time, it's something that we love so deeply. Because this was him bearing our penalty. And so when you see the cross, with one breath you look at Jesus and you say, I'm sorry. And at the same breath you also say, thank you. And when you walk away, you just have to shake your head and say, Jesus loves me. This I know. The cross I read about in the Bible, it tells me so. There's no way around that. The question is what we do with his love. Listen, his love for us is a settled fact. It doesn't change. No matter how many bad things we do, no matter how many dumb things we do. Now understand this, there's a difference between the love of God and the approval of God. The same way we love our kids, no matter what they do, we approve of everything they do? No. But we love them. And God's love for us is a fixed thing. And it literally fixed itself to a cross. To put it on public display, as Romans 3 would talk about. The question is, what are we going to do with it? I was watching a video this morning and I showed it to Brooke when we were getting ready. There is a world-renowned psychologist who has reached a lot of international fame in the last few years for his, some of his stance in, in, in politics, but really more of his just general approach to life. He speaks to morals from an agnostic kind of point of view. He's a brilliant man. And... Uh, he often will speak of the Bible, even though he's not necessarily a believer in it. And he, he's got a series of lectures on the Bible and, and some of the stories, looking at it through the, the viewpoint uh, of a psychologist. <clears throat> and um, I was watching this little two-minute clip of an interview he did, and Jesus was under discussion. And the classic atheistic approach to looking at Jesus is that when you look at other myths, there are other religious stories that have the death of a God and then the resurrection of that God. And that's usually the atheistic crux that Christianity is nothing separate because it's just following that same old mythological pattern. But even he said, he said, but that doesn't hold up. He said, it's a bad argument. He said, because there's something about Jesus that's rooted in history. The mythological things are not rooted in history, in time, in space, in history. And he talks about how 
the objective moral world and then what is called a narrative story of the world. And we don't have time to go into all that, but that's not key to understanding what we're going to say here in just a minute. That sometimes those two worlds intersect. Very rarely those two worlds intersect in other worldviews. And then he stops in the middle of the interview for about 10 seconds. And he speaks up and he says, I don't know why I find myself being drawn to Christianity. I don't know why I believe the story of Jesus. And he said, it's a terrifying thought. He said, if it's true, who would I become? Here's a man who looks at the entire world. He's been trained through scientific process to only look at things through that scientific method and process. And he looks at what Jesus absorbed in the cross. And he is moved to tears just by thinking through its implications. We're his children. What are we going to do with him? You see, it's one thing to study the cross and to be moved for a moment. That can happen to anybody. But if you watch Jesus' ministry very carefully, Jesus is not really concerned with people who are moved momentarily. As a matter of fact, when you watch his ministry closely, you will find that when large crowds start to follow him because they're moved by, in the moment, he will turn to the crowd and say something incredibly hard that he knows is going to offend them, and the majority of them walk away. It's everywhere. It's John 6, it's Luke 14. All throughout his ministry, you see him doing the same thing because Jesus is not concerned with momentarily being swept up. He's concerned that that momentary sweeping up turns into a lifetime of commitment. And so just because I'm moved from the cross, moved by a message of the cross, If it does not translate into my life, if it doesn't change the way I make decisions, if it doesn't change the way that I live, if it doesn't change the way that I treat people, then I've really not understood anything about the cross. Because it's transforming. Tonight, our crucified, risen Savior extends his arms to us yet again. having borne the penalty for our sins. And if a person tonight is outside of Christ, we invite you to come into him with a penitent faith that confesses him to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Or as New Testament Christians, we have not been. And I don't really think there's anybody in this room that would dare stand up and say, you know what, looking at what Jesus has done for me, I feel like I've done enough. I don't think there's any one of us that would say that. But at the same time, it is possible that some of us, if we were to look at the whole of our lives, would say, the commitment of Jesus to me and my commitment to him, they just don't match. He deserves our best. He deserves our all. He deserves everything. And if that hasn't been us, He's welcoming us back and waiting for us. And if we can help you do that, that's what we want to do as we stand.
Pray. 